I need to start, I suppose, with a couple of confessions. Uh, the first one being I'm a high school teacher, as you just kind of heard, which means I have a moderate caffeine addiction. Um, I have the best job in the world, in a very narrow psychological sense, and um, that I tend to spend most of my time hanging around with other people who spend a lot of time hanging around with teenagers. So my vocabulary may not be as um, clever as some, but the second confession I need to make is probably the big one. I work in the English Humanities Department, which means that I love words. And if, if there's something that really um, has fascinated me about today and about still about my job and about young people in general, which are the things that pull me together, it's words. I want, if you will, um, now apologies to any students in the audience, I've done this with every English class I've had as far as I know at the start of every subject, usually around the time of kind of why Shakespeare, sir, or something like that. But I wonder if you'll indulge me for a moment in a little bit of interaction. I want you to, I want you to do something. I want to challenge you to do something. Close your eyes if you need to. I want you to engage your imagination, engage your creativity at every level that you have. And I want you to imagine something, anything, a colour, a place, an invention, a person, a concept that you cannot describe with words. Go now. I'll give you some time. Not a lot of time. I'm on the timer and I'm notoriously bad with time. So you're going to have a few seconds. Come on, get it going. Be creative. Be creative. Use it. Hold the space. Close your eyes. Stand up if you need to. Anything that you cannot describe with words. Have you got it? There it is. Hold it there. Hold it there. Fantastic. Done. My exercise is finished. My talk's over. Thank you very much. No. Um, what I um, defiantly say to you is that I just set you an impossible task. That words are incredibly important. They're not just the way we communicate. They're the way that we think. I don't actually believe you can learn anything personally until you've attached it to a word and filed it away. I want you to think about words like the filing cabinet of your mind. That's what makes my job exciting. That's what makes it such a privilege to be kind of in that space where I'm introducing words to young people in all of their different contexts. Now, I know there's always some in the class, and I'm sure there's some in this audience who are sitting there going, nah, man, I got this. I thought of something. It's here. It's still here. Defy you to say otherwise. Well, I say to you that's fine because you've still proven my point. If you really did in all of that creative space inside of your mind manage to grab a hold of something that you can't describe with words, it's useless to you and it's useless to me because you can't share it with the world. So either way, words are incredibly important. Now, I'll tell you a challenge for me. And I want to get to the little tiny way. And I say little tiny because I've got a little tiny space of the world that I'm trying to change. They come to me in groups of about 25 or so in 40-minute blocks. I want, to, I want to introduce you to a couple of words that I think are important in my space right now. They may not be the big words, but they are. But words are incredibly important. There's little ones and big ones. There's descriptive ones and conceptual ones. They come in and out of favour. There's cuss words. There's cuss words that used to be cuss words, and then there's cuss words that are now becoming cuss words, and there's all sorts of words in between. And the information age, the time that we live in right now for our young people, the time of the pocket world, if you're wondering what pocket world refers to, put it in the wrong pocket, funnily enough, refers to this. The information age, the age where our young people engage more with this little screen in some, on some days than they do with adult intellectual um, conversation, than they do with their own families at times, than they do with good old books, other sorts of concepts that excite me. The pocket world, the information age, has exposed young people to infinitesimally, I don't even know if that is a word, more words, more concepts. They've overflowed their filing cabinet with ideas. And it's at the same time eroded away on the voices that would give them context. Now, I'm like probably few of you, I can't see much because the lights are bright in this direction, but I'm like a few of you in the audience, I'm sure, of the Generation X vintage. I still remember with wistful fondness, gather the grandkitties, don't have any grandkids, but you know what I mean, I'm being metaphorical, gather the kitties around and say, I remember the days before the big bad interwebs. I remember when big words and explanations came at me from people of authority that it was safe to believe. My parents, teachers, leaders, 
that guy in the suit that reads the news, you know the one I'm talking about. I had, a, I got a story. I, I got a story. I got to tell you a story. I love stories. This is probably where I'll blow my time, but that's so be it. I did work experience in year ten at Wind Television in Wollongong. And there's a guy there used to read the news and I scored myself a gig one afternoon in the camera room in the studio where they were recording the six o'clock news on wind television. And he came in. Now, in the best possible kind of 80s way, he had really nicely done hair with the gel. Shirt was immaculate, big wide tie, perfect knot, great suit, suit jacket at least, but he was wearing jeans and sand shoes. Destroyed my world. Something broke inside of me at that moment. He sat down behind the news desk and when the cameras rolled, he looked for all intents and purposes like the perfect authority figure. But I knew that he was just wearing ripped jeans even and sand shoes underneath all of that. Any of you remember Graham Kennedy? He totally destroyed that idea for the rest of us if you're old enough for that vintage later on. But we'll get, that's another TED talk. But I know that authority figure, I know that there was this kind of picture in my childhood. There was a safety with the words that were explained to me and the way that I swallowed them, that does not exist anymore. I did a little, um, in my own pocket, well, did a little word association game just to kind of make my point. Went with a couple of the big trending topics, big global trending topics. Um, Donald Trump, <gasps> not that interested in American politics to be honest, but it appears the world is. Um, this was an article about the cover photo of an article the content of which I still, after reading this article, don't know. Um, apparently, New Yorker depicts Trump as a dangerous clown. However, the same man, through the same pocket world, um, vanquished the new world order, according to that article, with a handshake and a sound bite. I didn't know they were that easy to defeat. You'd think they would have done that before. When I, upon reading that article, that was actually an article about a handshake and the possible, um, the possible ramifications of three words that were spoken at the time. I went to climate change. Billions of dollars in losses. Climate change is a big deal, don't get me wrong. I'm not making light of these topics. But I'm trying to find answers in the pocket world. And I'm finding a lot of words and a lot of big concepts and not a lot of substance. Climate change is already costing the US billions. Or it is the biggest scientific fraud ever perpetrated. Same phone, same world. I love the little colon scientist. It was definitely a scientist that said it. We have it on record. And finally, the one most tragic of all, I don't know whether you guys ever participated in this, but man, Qui-Gon Jinn got stabbed in my favourite movie, sorry I'm digressing, and then he died on October 28, 2017. Liam Neeson. Reports are that it was a hoax, that he's still alive. Now, I'm not really sure because I've never met Liam Neeson in person, but um, apparently he didn't die. The information age is crazy. Okay, and it is getting harder and harder for our students, for our young people, for your kids to know things in that space, particularly through their pocket world. So what I want to do is talk to you about a couple of simple words. They're not necessarily big words, but they're two words that I find important in my little space in hopefully doing something to teach our young people to negotiate their life, their identity, who they are and what they know in this pocket world. Inquiry. I'm not talking about the please may I help you kind. I'm talking about a fairly specific educationally focused definition of inquiry. Now it's not a new word and it's not even a new educational concept but it has very new and valid application in today's world. It is a tool if you like. Um, in edu speak it is a whole bunch of things. It is student focused learning. It is um, differentiated pedagogy, focused curiosity. It's, got, it's a buzzword in education at the moment, but I think of it just like the GPS for the information age. I think of it like teaching students how to ask the right question and then find the right answer. Done properly, and I'm not even standing up here as an expert saying that I can do it properly yet, but I intend to get as good at it as I can. It's focused curiosity. And that's about all I really want to say on the matter hoping some of you feel a little ripped off by that. I mean, 
did, did we charge for tickets? I'm not sure how it even worked here to get to TEDx, but surely this teacher, I mean, I've been doing this for a little while, he would have more to say on such an important educational buzzword as inquiry, but you know what? I don't have to be the expert in the new paradigm. I'm hoping that some of you feel a little dissatisfied right now with my explanation. I'm hoping some of you might even dare to do a little searching yourself. You're all perfect candidates right now for your own inquiry and your own learning journey, and that's really what it's about. Talk about another word, moving along. My second one, representation. I'm listening to the collective groan from the senior students in the room. This is a word that appears probably more often than any other word in the actual texts, in the actual curriculum documents, in the actual planning, in the actual stuff that goes on in my classroom. This word inundates us. And if the, if the inquiry is the GPS for the information age, this one, I dare say, is the vaccine for the algorithm. And I'll get to, you, I'll get to that in a moment. You see, everything would be sweet and fine if two things would just happen. If kids, first of all, would just listen to the people that know them about who they are. If that could be done, well, if I could make that into a pill and sell it, we wouldn't need half of what we do in school and we could all go home early. But no, young people, old people, every person finds themselves reflected back in this pocket world. And secondly, the internet just won't sit still. If it would just be the filing cabinet that it's designed to be, where we could just put the world in nice ordered places and everybody could just go exactly where they need to to find exactly what they want, everything would be perfect. And we could just stand there and put it in the corner. We could have a computer lab set up. And when you need to know something, you just go and click on the right thing and find the right information from authoritative sources. And now you know something and congratulations, you've been educated. But it doesn't work like that. See, what the internet's doing is constantly collecting everything it can about your affiliations, religious, political, sporting, about your habits, spending, traveling, viewing, about your networks, about your contacts, about your inbox. And it's doing this to sell you things. It's doing this to make a dollar. And it will actually tailor your internet experience to maximize the effect and impact of that marketplace. So the rub is that my pocket world is not the same as any of yours. In fact, it's not really the world at all. It's a representation, if you dare, of the world. It's been over and over and over again. Man, in senior English, if I can preach it for a second, we, we talk about this, we talk about representations of race and, and, and gender and love and, and, and beauty and, and, and religion and everything we can think of, to be perfectly honest. I've sat in meetings where we've gone, we're going to run some electives this term. How many different representations can we offer these students to look at? We are fascinated by the concept because there's a literacy here that's incredibly important. I'll tell you, I, I honestly, I don't know how many Star Wars memes and gaming videos I had to look at on my Facebook feed to repair it from a quick search about Donald Trump and climate change. It changed the face of my pocket world dramatically. It still has, I believe. I'm not going to go in there yet. I don't like it. But, you know, I can laugh about Putin and I can laugh about Trump and I can laugh about Liam Neeson because I'm Generation X. I have a scepticism that's born of perspective. The generation that I'm educating does not have any such perspective. They've been born into it. And so this literacy, I believe, is incredibly important. We ask pretty much three simple questions as often as we can. What is it that you're actually seeing here? What's the idea below? What's the ideology driving? What's the worldview represented here? How is it constructed? Ever so important. Firstly, so you can identify it when it's coming at you sideways and you don't recognise the genre. And secondly, so you can partake in it yourself and change the world when you need to. And thirdly, why? Why are they doing it? Why do you care? I often get a sad response to that third question, so I try not to ask it as often as, as, as some. But, um, but truthfully, that's the one. And that's about where I want to leave this tonight. I think that the concept of inquiry, 
I think that the idea of a learning journey that's student driven, and I think the literacy, the literacy of the world of representation, whether it's profile lists or porn clips, whether it's likes lists, whether it's advertising images, whether it's your inbox, your contact list, whether it's your Friday night reading or what you look at on YouTube. I think that there's a world out there that needs to be presented and represented the right way. And I think that I'm trying to use these two concepts to change the world. Thanks for listening.